full screen mode. Okay, so this is lecture 37 of ECE 5312. And so in this lecture, what we're going to be focusing on is we're going to jump a little more deeper into diversity techniques. So in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to explore how these diversity techniques actually prove to be, uh, you know, prove to have some sort of advantage in a digital communication system, right? So some of your homework assignments that you saw in the previous lectures, you were like wondering about like using frequency diversity when you have a specific coherence bandwidth and then you have an overall bandwidth that's way wider, how you can exploit the coherence bandwidth and break up your transmission down narrow bands that they will be effectively treated differently, independently across frequency, right? So what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to look a little bit more at the mathematics behind um, diversity techniques. In particular, we're going to look at uh, frequency diversity and we're going to use orthogonal signaling. So it's been a long time since we played with orthogonal, orthogonal signaling in this class. When was the last time we looked at things like FSK and such? So remember, I can't even remember, it must have been easily 15 lectures ago, and we came up with the closed form solution for the probability bit error. Remember that? How did we achieve that? We had to assume an m -ary modulation scheme that was orthogonal, and to get that it was FSK, right? So that, that was pretty serious. We're going to use that same sort of construct here in order to show diversity in action. Even with one of your um, class problems in the last lecture, we began talking a little bit about diversity. We looked at examples where FSK was sort of the modulation type to be used, right? Although I disagree with them using for FSK. Like, what were they thinking, right? So in any case, so let's, so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to look at diversity techniques. We're going to look at an MRE signal, signal constellation, right? An MRE modulation scheme. And then we're going to go through the mathematics, and then we're going to sort of bring it back. Let's say we have just a binary version, how it would look. So how would it degenerate into something rather simple, right? So we're going to go through all this exercise. And in particular, what we're going to look at is the performance of these MRE orthogonal signals transmitted in a Rayleigh fading channel. And what's, what's nice about Rayleigh fading is so, so what happens is we know mathematically what that's going to look like, right, as we're going to see. So as I mentioned, I let the cat out of the bag already. I mentioned, oh, there we go. Let's choose blue. There we go. Okay. Boop. So what happens is we're going to be dealing with an Emery FSK signal because that possesses uh, orthogonality between each one of those, uh, like, you know, across all the dimensions, all those signals. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the same information is transmitted on L diversity channels. All right? So we're assuming some sort of frequency diversity here. We have L channels across some spectral bandwidth, and we're going to send the same information using this MRE signal constellation in order to convey that information across, right? So it's going to be L copies across this bandwidth, and it's going to have this type of modulation scheme. Okay? So far, so good. So, so far, I've just sort of specked out what we're going to be talking about. Okay. <sighs> Clear ink. Ah, see? Technology doesn't fail me yet. So, what's the first thing we want to do? So, remember, again, so we're dealing with um, an MRE signal constellation. Um, it, it's FSK. So, let's say to simplify, well, not, maybe not necessarily simplify our lives. What did we also see many lectures ago in terms of the type of detection that we're going to use. So what we're going to assume is we're going to have some sort of fading, some sort of distortion caused by the channel. In this case, it's Rayleigh. And we're going to have noise injected into the signal, right? So what happens is, OK, we have these, um, you know, these sort of distortions introduced. We have L parallel realizations in L different frequency bands being conveyed at the same time. And on top of that, we're going to make the big assumption here. Um, okay, there we go. 
we're going to make the big assumption that we're using non-coherent detection. So non-coherent detection, what does that instantly mean? Square law device. Right? We're going to, we're, all we care about is the envelope. Right? So what we're going to do, what w inherently is we have a square law device here. We're going to get rid of all the phase information. All we care about is that envelope information. Right? So we saw this before. So none of this, all of this should be like, wow, it's deja vu all over again. It's like, I've seen this, and you should have. So we're going to use same sort of uh, notation as before. So we're going to have this sort of like um, parameter here, this the, the variable u1. And what is u1? u1 essentially is, so suppose you have your, your, your signal, and this is like, you know, your frequency modulation, right, uh, for the FSK. Uh, you have its energy, and then you have its attenuation. You have noise, oops, and then it goes through a square law device, right? And then we sum all L versions of it. So far, so good? So what we're doing, essentially, is we get the L copies of this guy. It's being attenuated by the Rayleigh fading channel. It has noise introduce, introduced into it. Every one, of those uh, every one of those copies goes through a square law device. So it's magnitude squared. We only get the amplitude. And then we sum the whole shabam together. Right? Why do we do that? Because let's say, what is, the, what is the purpose of diversity? It's almost like, why do I pack four flashlights in my car? Because in case the first three die, I still have a fourth one to change that tire, right? Shame on you for not even having one flashlight in your car, except for Neil. Woo! I had oh, you did, see? Right. Diversity! Right. Three. <laughs> oh, you're getting there. OK, OK, so three. So. But this is a cool, cool situation, because remember, remember what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to try and find the performance of this technique, right? So what do we call this guy here? What is U1? This is the result of when we have L copies that have been attenuated by a Rayleigh fading channel and has noise added, as opposed to, let's say, nothing. Nothing being picked up. So, okay, so let's backtrack, okay? So what happens is the other remaining m minus 1 co combinations, right? So we have, so let's say, so it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. So what happens is we have L channels, and on each one of those channels, just like what we did before, not so much the coherent detection with the match filtering and the, um, and the correlator realization. We're talking about the non-coherent detection. How did that work? We look at every possible signal, right? And then what happens is we, we did some sort of processing. We multiplied it against, we then low-pass filtered, and all we get if it's the incorrect signal, if they're orthogonal, what should be the output of all that processing of the non-coherent at the end? Should just be the noise magnitude squared, right? Because if it's a mismatch, if it's two different symbols, they're orthogonal. They should not, they should end up being zip, zero, nada, right? If it is the exact desired signal, then we should have a hit. And yeah, my mistake, it should, that's not the frequency, that's the phase offset, right? So when I have two of the same orthogonal signals, and they're just a phase offset, and you do all this combination, all this magic, this low-pass filtering, like what we did with non-coherent detection before, what happens? All that's resulting is that phase offset as a term, which we see there, with the attenuation factor, energy, blah, 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 whatever sort of stuff you, the amplitude information of your signal plus the phase offset between uh, the transmit and the receive, sig um, you know, the, what you're matching it with and the remaining noise. If, there are, or if it is not the same signal, if let's say, if, if, if we're trying to match signal one with signal two or signal three or signal four, they should not at all produce anything and all you've got is noise. So it's a non-issue, right? So the desire here, the desire, so, you know, what do we like calculating when we do digital communications? Probability of bit error, right? Right? But that sounds negative. It also sounds, in this case, I assure you, 
what happens is it's way easier if we calculate the probability of correct reception. You know, the optimist in me says, we should look at the probability of correct reception, and then 1 minus that gives me the probability of bit error. Ah, ha, ha. So that's what we're going to do. So let, let me... Blue, blue, blue. Let, let me backtrack a little bit. No, not there. <sighs> Clear ink. Okay, so how? Do, so let's 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 look at this again. So how does this work? So we, let's say we have L channels. That's channel one, channel two channel 3 all the way to channel L. Correct? Right? What we then do it's a little bit of an elaborate diagram, but I think it will just you know, sort of make the point and then we can move on. What ends up happening is then we have signal 1 and we look at that guy. Okay, signal 2, signal 3. So we're not, we're not doing correlation or match filter base. We're actually doing all that non-coherent detection on. So this is the non-coherent detection, NCD, for signal 1, signal 2, signal 3. So what we're doing is we're looking at Let's say whatever signals on channel 1, is it signal 1 in the MRE signal constellation scheme? Is it signal 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to M? And then we, just like what we do before, we do choose max, whoever max is. And then what ends up happening, we do the same thing here, we do the same thing here, we do the same thing here. Sum, and then produce. So why do we have this? So this produces your UI. And why do we have this? What happens is we have L diversity. We have L, uh, uh, like, you know, L paths of diversity. So if let's say one or, there are one or two sort of branches that give incorrect results, we hope that the majority will smooth things out and we still make the right decision at the end with respect to what's been transmitted. Yep. But ideally, all of them should get the same, uh, same, the uh, same signal, right? So the, so the question is, ideally, they should all get the same? Ideally, yes. But what happens is if the Rayleigh fading is different on some of the branches, because what happens is what might be happening on one branch, if the diversity is totally independent, one branch might be heavily attenuated and will give a corrupted answer, and another one might be totally good and stuff. So, so ideally, if we had like zero fading, absolutely. Like, unless there's like a f f freaky amount of noise in one that really messes up the calculation, uh, what should happen is they should, all, all L's should be the same, but if there's fading in some of them, this is an attempt where it's like the majority says this. And this, this form, what we call is equal. Well, it's like equal gain combining. That, like, if you use maximal ratio combining, you would then say, um, you know, you would incorporate other parameters. Like, you would, you would use things like signal to noise ratio, um, or, uh, or you, can, you can also, like, come up with, like, other sort of schemes where you say, well, the majority is this. I'm going to totally discount those guys that don't include the majority. So you can do a variety of different ways, right? So maximal ratio combining kind of like weighs everyone. So, well, this guy has a very high SNR, so I believe him more than this guy, which has a very pathetic SNR. Others might be majority rules are like a voting-based system. And then I only take the, choose the M, no, sorry, M we were already using, K out of L, that, co that seems to be a majority, right? And discount the rest, right? So good points, good points. So th graphically, this is what's happening. So you might say, where am I summing? Where am I summing L? And then I have M. Like, you know, so this is what's happening. L diversity paths, and then I have M signals that I can choose from, from those, each one of those L paths, and they all get summed together into this, like, decision variable UI. Okay? Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. Ah. So... 
going back to this guy. So what we see is this is the equation when we get it right. So we assume u1 is, this is the desired, without, without loss of generality. This is when we get signal plus noise through the square law device. Here is everyone else. That's what we ideally should have, right? And so like what I mentioned before, I let the cat out of the bag. What happens is, first of all, I can't, I, you know, I'm, t I, I'm, I'm basically not going to like ha tell a suspense story. It's easier to go down the path of correct perception than doing the probability of error. Trust me. Okay? And then the second thing is, notice that these guys are mutually independent. The orthogonal signals are independent. Um, the noise process, these things are, so this is super important. We're creating decision variables, these UIs that are mutually independent. I'm setting something up, right? And what is that setup? <sighs> I'll show you. <laughs> what happens is the following. First of all, we know that the PDF, okay, so we have this UI business, right? What do we know about this, U, this U1? So U1 has a Rayleigh fading component plus a Gaussian noise component, magnitude squared. What does that give us? It turns out that that, this U1, because essentially we have these magnitude squareds of these, these guys, then summed together we end up getting chi squared distribution 2L. The 2L comes from the L branches, so we actually have um, like, you know, all these individual components sum together, and therefore we have this like massive distribution, chi squared 2L uh, degrees of freedom, right? And you might say, okay, so here's the expression, that's cool, but what does, what's sigma 1 squared? That's always been the question. What is sigma 1 squared? And it's equal to this big, messy thing, right? So we have this guy, no surprise, and the expectation of it, the mean of that guy, squared because it's a zero mean noise, right? And so what we do is we can rewrite it like this. And so what ends up happening is, one but the other guys, the, U1, the U2s, the U3s, all the way to UM, they can be described by this chi squared distribution, right? And this one's a little bit easier because it's only noise, okay? Now, this is the probability that I want to calculate. What does this probability say? I want U1 to be the largest possible, because when I do choose max, I want to choose max. I want to choose U1, right? U2, U3, U4, U5 must be beaten by U1 in order for this thing to correctly work. So what, is the pro what, is, what are the conditions for probability of correct reception? U2 must be less than U1. And U3 must be less than U1. And, and I keep on going, right? Oh, didn't I say something about mutual independence? With the U's, right? The U's! What happens is, when they're mutually independent, the, that big, big behemoth of a probability can be now broken down, right? And what happens is, we can say that U1, I mean, sorry, U2, U3, U4, we can essentially say, well, they all kind of have the same sort of statistical characteristic. They all are represented by this guy here. So what we can do is, well, essentially, let's say we take U2 without loss of generality, but you can use U3, U4, U5, whatever. It must be less than U1, M to the minus 1. Those are the number of comparison cases to ensure that this is the probability of correct reception. Okay? So this guy here. Now, this guy is a problem. So there's just problems, but I have solutions. What happens is U1 is random. U2 is random. The, the variable, not the music band. The music band is always awesome. So what happens is how do we solve when we have the probability of one random variable less than the probability of another random variable? Sorry, the probability that this random variable is less than that random variable 
we now use conditional probabilities. So we say, oh, let's say u1 is fixed. And then we average u1 across all possible u1 values. So we use this guy here, right? So what ends up happening is what we do now is we take, there's a lot of scribble, but what happens is we get this guy, we take the conditional probability. So, so this is the conditional probability that u2 is less than, so, so what happens is we know that nothing for Rayleigh, chi squared and everything doesn't go below zero. So we integrate from zero, because there's no negative values, all the way to u1, right? So what is the probability that u2, the variable, will produce a value that's less than u1? And we know that it cannot produce a value less than zero. So we integrate from zero to u2, uh, sorry, zero to u1, and this is the PDF of u2. u2 has a PDF. Doesn't surprise me. So what ends up happening, if we take this one step further, remember I said, now let's glass half full, half empty. Okay. Now what happens is we go from the half full side to the half empty side. Aww. But so and how do you achieve that? It's a complementary function, right? So now, what is the probability? What is the overall probability of correct reception? Now what you do is you take this probability, which we saw from the last slide, multiply by the PDF for U1 and average across all U1s. Okay? And so the math gets messy. And essentially what ends up happening is if you go through all of this rigmarole and you use this little trick here, okay? So what is, this, what is the summation? Like you have this summation brought to the power of n should be equal to that, okay? So if you plug that in, what you end up getting is this thing here. Oh yeah, easy. So if there was a quiz next week, no, just kidding. Derive this in 20 minutes. No, 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 no. So what ends up happening is, suppose you don't have diversity, this is what you get, okay? So if you have an L equals 1 case, what happens is you don't have, first of all, you don't have chi squared of 2 L degrees of freedom, right? You, you will have, what is it, L equals 1? 2 degrees of freedom, correct? And so what everything whittles down to is this expression here. Now, again, this is a lot of rigmarole. It's like, you know, okay, we have all this math, we have this exact bound, we have it on an orthogonal signaling basis, blah, 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 blah. Now, let's say we, we want to do away with the exact stuff, right? Because that thing on top looks very scary. So what do you do instead? Turn off bound. Yes. Who said that? No. So what ends up happening is it really comes down to that beautiful expression for the turnoff bound. So I'm, I'm going to just cut ahead. So everyone should remember what the turnoff bound looks like. Right? So if you have, okay, this sort of probability expression, right? Um, so you have, uh, and then, and you can actually convert it. If you have the right parameters, you can convert it into an expectation of some sort of exponential and you plug your random variable into the exponent, okay? So how do we do that here? Well, what ends up happening is uh, the following. So, okay, so I, I did cut ahead. Let's go back one slide. But, but everyone should remember that. That's one of several bounds that you should be familiar with. So first of all, so let's say we have u1 and we have u2. And, we, and let's say we go back to that probability of error business, right? So in this case, what is the probability that u2, u2 minus u1 is greater than 0? What is another way of saying this? What is the probability that u2 produces a value that is greater than u1? That's an error scenario, right? So let's bring u1 to the left-hand side, okay? We call u2 minus u1, we, give, we assign it a new random variable. We call it x, right? And then what happens is we know what this probability is, right? What is the probability? You take the PDF of x and you integrate from 0 to infinity. So, so far it's probability. And we, and we basically call it 
PBL. And so if we go to the next slide, what ends up happening is, so x now can be expressed like this thing. And if we go through, if we plug now x into the exponent, we get this expression. This is part of the turnoff bound. We know this from the previous slide. And what's interesting about this expression here? What happens when you have an exponent? You have an exponent that consists of independent random variables, and then you take the expectation of it. So first of all, what happens to the exponent when you sum all these iid random variables together? First of all, what happens is it's going to be the product of e to the first random variable times e to the second random variable times e to the third random variable, blah, 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 right? And then the expectation of that. What is the expectation of e to one random variable and e to another random variable, and all those random variables are all independent, then the expectation, sorry, the, the exponent of those independent random variables are also independent to each other. And what happens if you take the expectation of independent random variables or functions of random variables, you can take the expectation of the individual functions of random variables. Oh, so this is great, because now I go from messy summation inside this uh, expected value to the product of individual expectations. You know there's a restaurant in Montreal called Expectations. I'm not sure if it's still in business, but uh, I think it was a chain. And there, there were a breakfast joint that served eggs, among other things. Like, yeah. So uh, when, I, when I mentioned that, I'm like, hmm, breakfast. Anyways, OK. So because of independence, we can now break up um, you know, all these expectations into the individual expectations, take the product of them. We also can break up, we have here this term and that term. So not only do we have like summation of all these uh, sort of uh, combination terms of u1 and u2, we can also decompose each one of those terms. It's a subtraction. So we can break those up into e to whatever, whatever term times e to the other term. In this case, we have e to the squiggle absolute value of nk2 squared times e, uh, expectation of e to the minus, right? This guy here, squiggle absolute value of 2 epsilon alpha k plus nk1. So that is u1. And the other guy here is u2, right? So I can break it down even further and further and further and further. So this is great. I know what this is equal to, right? Individually, right? So this guy here, this is n. This is Gaussian magnitude squared brought to the e power. So what, what's that guy? Right? And same thing here. And so what ends up happening if we take now these two guys, plug them in here and here, we now have an overall expression. If we bring that down, it's this bound, this really cool bound, that ultimately gives us, you know, this expression here. And as for squiggle, so what we try to do is squiggle. I don't know what character that is, so I just call it squiggle. Um, basically, what we want to do is we want, if, if we take, if we use, uh, um, if we take uh, uh, differential equations, you know, we try and find the first and second order derivatives, and then try and find, a, uh, in this case, the minimum, you know, we basically try and m um, minimize the Chernoff bound. So we first of all find if it's an extrema point, and then we find out if it's a minima or a maxima, right? So first and second order derivatives. It turns out that squiggle, the optimal squiggle for achieving that, is this expression here. So you plug that back in to get these guys. Looks a lot better than the previous derivation, right? I would prefer calculating the bound rather than blah, 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 this equation that spans the entire width of a page, OK? OK. So with that, um, with that, th this concludes 
uh, lecture uh, 37. Yay. Okay. Squiggle. <laughs> I don't know. I, I somehow, actually there was